Hi, my name is Dr. Michelle Cotty, and I'm a psychiatric nurse practitioner and mental health. And today I'm here to talk to you about cognitive behavioral therapy. Cognitive behavioral therapy is also known as CBT. And basically, cognitive behavioral therapy helps you be more aware of what you're thinking, how you're feeling, and how you're acting, and how all of those things interact together. So I'm going to share a screen with you, and this is my own personal website. And on this screen, you will see a link to some worksheets, and we'll be using those worksheets um, as we discuss this further. The first thing you'll see on this screen is a short introduction to CBT featuring Dr. Judith Beck. Dr. Beck is, a, is the daughter um, of Dr. Aaron Beck who invented cognitive behavioral therapy. So it's a really short video if you'd like to find out more. So if you think of a triangle, cognitive behavioral therapy helps us identify our thoughts, our emotions, our behaviors, and those would be at the corners of the triangle. And situations would be in the middle of the triangle. So people's negative beliefs can be one factor that predisposes them to depression when they encounter particular life stressors. When people become depressed, they begin to process information differently. And it's the true with anxiety. So one of the first things that we want to do is we want to identify signs and symptoms of depression. Once we know our own individual signs, then we can address the depression when it starts. So there's a link on this screen that also has signs and symptoms of depression. Now, not all signs and symptoms of depression are on this list. So as it says here, the first thing that happens when I start to feel depressed is I stop doing laundry. So if my laundry is piled up and my socks aren't matched, something is not heading in the right direction for me. And I know I need to make different choices. You can also identify signs and symptoms of anxiety. So perhaps you struggle with anxiety more than you struggle with depression. Then you may want to focus on that as we're talking. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to practice identifying how we're feeling and what we need. So a lot of us are actually really bad at identifying our own feelings. Why? Because when we're kids, sometimes we're taught that our feelings don't matter. And then we can become really passive. And as adults, we can become either passive aggressive or really assertive and sometimes explode like volcanic word vomit. And we feel really bad. Other times we might implode and we're really hard on ourselves. So what we want to do is we want to try to use assertive communication, which can feel really um, uncomfortable if we're not used to doing it. So nonviolent communication is a formula for how to use assertive communication. It's a healthy way to communicate and it helps us state what we want, what we need, helps with boundaries, and it's respectful. So there are four steps. The first step is state a fact. So for example, when you leave the dishes in the dishwasher, then identify what you're feeling. I feel angry, frustrated, mad. Then identify what you need. I need consideration and respect. Finally, ask for what you want. Do you think you could rinse the, the dishes and put them in the dishwasher. So everyone has the same basic needs and wants. And when we learn to identify these feelings and to communicate in a healthy manner, then we can all get along better and actually get what we need. Now there are some rules. There are no name callings when we are using this formula. So name, no name calling, no put downs. And the other person can't say, but when you don't make the bed, time out. Um, we can talk about that later, but right now we're going to talk about the dishes. So I'd be happy to talk to you about anything else after we process this. So here you will see nonviolent communication handout, and you can see a list of feelings when we are satisfied and when we're happy and feelings when we're not. And then on the third page are needs. So all human beings have the need for connection, physical well-being, meaning, honesty, play. 
and the final page has the formula. Sometimes when you go through this process, you actually just feel better. Not even saying out loud, but going through it on paper. I like to ask myself, how old was I when I first had this feeling? And what need of mine wasn't getting met? And then I'm an adult and now I can meet all of my own needs. And so sometimes for me, that's just enough, acknowledging why I'm having such a strong feeling in the moment. Um, so if you're going through a particularly emotional time in your life, you might even want to print this off, um, take pictures of it, keep it on your phone so that you can refer to it when you're stressed out. So the next thing that we're going to do is draw a triangle. And on the top of the triangle, um, we're going to have a thought on the bottom an emotion on the bottom right, an emotion, and on the bottom left, a behavior. So think for a minute about a time when you had a strong emotion or behavior that you did not like. Then we're going to use the feeling list to identify what you were feeling. So a strong emotion or behavior that you did not like and write that situation in the middle of the triangle. So what were you thinking when this situation was occurring? Write that at the top. And on the bottom right, what was your emotion? Now on the bottom left, we might, we're gonna write our behavior. So if we're thinking about the dishes scenario, maybe I had a long day at work, I'm exhausted, I have six hours more worth of things I need to do and only four hours left in the day, and I see the dishes in the sink, and the very first thing I think is I work so hard, nobody appreciates what I do, and they all take advantage of me and think I'm their maid. Maybe that's what I was thinking. So my emotion that time would be frustrated, angry, mad, and maybe my behavior was that I screamed, I did the dishes myself, and I left the room crying and everybody was angry. So that would be a situation that I would have a strong emotion and a behavior that I did not like. Now, just set that aside, and we're going to talk about some other examples of people's experiences. So remember, people's negative beliefs can be one factor that predisposes them to depression, in particular when they have a life stressor. And when people become depressed or anxious, they process information differently. An automatic thought changes our behaviors and feelings. So when something happens, we have an automatic thought that pops into our head. And we're going to look at some examples um, of how two people can experience things really differently. And this worksheet was from the Beck Institute, a course I took. So the cognitive model. The situation is that Jason and Kurt both receive a negative evaluation at work. So Jason says, I can't do anything right because I and I might get fired because of this. That is his negative thought. He feels depressed and nervous, and his behavior is that now he avoids his boss because he believes he's in trouble. He feels nervous that the next time he's confronted with challenging work and performs poorly. Um, so his emotion is depressed and nervous, and his behavior is that he's avoiding his boss. Kurt has a rational thought. I guess I didn't work hard enough. I'll have to come up with a better plan for next time. His emotion is disappointment, but motivation. So he behaves differently. Kurt seeks out his boss to talk about how he can improve and he approaches his next task as a challenge and gradually improves. And the next example, Gwen and Shirley both have an argument with a close friend. So Gwen thinks right away, we always argue, why can't she ever see my side? This is so unfair. So Gwen has a negative thought. 
Shirley thinks, wow, that was rough. I should apologize. We can both be stubborn sometimes. Gwen has the emotion of anger and blame, and Shirley feels forgiving and regretful. So Gwen stays angry at her friend and doesn't reach out to repair the relationship. Over time, her friendship becomes more toxic. Shirley, on the other hand, accepts a portion of responsibility and apologizes. They communicate and continue to strengthen their friendship. So as you look at this worksheet, there are opportunities for you to see somebody's negative thought and emotion, and then to replace it with a rational thought and emotion. And when we have a new emotion, we have a new behavior. Feel free to stop the video if you'd like to work on that now. The next thing in each of these lessons at there is that there is a um, healthy coping tool. And this week there's a guided meditation. So if you don't like this particular meditation, you can find your own on YouTube. Um, I saw the Dalai Lama recently say, you only have to start meditating for 10 seconds. So this is five minutes. If you don't make it five minutes, it's okay. Just start for 10 seconds. The idea is to try and clear your mind. And if a thought enters your mind, just look at it. Don't, don't give it any energy and tell it it can leave now. So the idea of meditation is that we sit, sit with a clear mind. So guided meditations are a good way to start because there's a story that somebody is telling you to listen to. So you kind of occupy your mind with other thoughts. Um, when we identify automatic thoughts, then we can help change them. So if you're looking back to the triangle, I want you to think about what automatic thoughts you might have had when that situation happened. And here are some automatic thoughts that might have arisen. So let's see here, black or white thinking. So all or nothing, nothing thinking. You see things only in two categories. They're either black or white with no shades of gray. I have to do a great job on everything. Fortune telling. You make negative predictions about what will happen when other outcomes are more likely. I'll always have trouble figuring out my thoughts. Labeling. You put a global negative label on yourself. I'm a failure for making a mistake. Emotional reasoning. You believe something must be true because it feels true. So I am incompetent. Selective abstraction. You only pay attention to the bad things about yourself. Instead of considering all of the things, I made so many mistakes. You probably also did a lot of things right, um, which leads us to overgeneralization. I do everything wrong. You draw a general conclusion based on a very small amount of evidence. Mind reading, um, you know what others are thinking. They probably think I'm foolish. Personalization, you take everything personally, even when Somebody's actions might not have anything to do with you at all, or they might have other intentions. They did that to me on purpose. Imperatives. I should always do my absolute best. So you have an unreasonable, rigid idea about how you or others have to behave. And finally, magnification and minimization. You magnify the negatives or minim minimize the positives. I'm no good at figuring out what to do. And it does not matter that I have good common sense. So we want to be aware of our negative thought distortions. So those are called cognitive distortions. And when you look at the situation in the triangle earlier, you can maybe identify with some of these distortions. So CBT is used to help us identify our thoughts, emotion, and behaviors. Our negative beliefs can be one factor that predisposes us to depression and anxiety, especially when we encounter life stressors. When we are depressed or anxious, we process information differently. So my challenge to you is this week to pay attention to what you're thinking, pay attention to what you're feeling and what you need, and try to notice if you are having any cognitive distortions. In addition, Try to do a guided meditation, either this one or one that you find on your own, every night. 
attach it to something you already do. When we attach a new behavior to a habit that we already have, we're more likely to keep it. And remember, small changes over time make really big differences. So thank you for listening today. And I hope that you enjoyed this introduction to cognitive behavioral therapy and that you meet your goal this week of trying to analyze your thoughts, behaviors, and feelings as situations arise.